presented by Phoenix Rising. Phoenix Rising here, and tonight we're going to be doing a review of the Leupold Tracker 2 HD. Now, this is Leupold's latest and greatest thermal imaging device. It's being marketed as a game finder and a game tracking device, and it is also a thermal imager. So, that being said, let's talk a little bit about it. We'll talk about what we're going to go over, and then we'll get into our review. So, uh, first off, this is a 320 by 240 resolution thermal imager that operates at 25 hertz. Now that's a fairly respectable image quality and speed for a handheld tracking device. Uh, it's operated on a one single 123 battery, which again is common, easy to find. I use rechargeables and uh, it works fine on those. And it has a 1.2 inch display in the back that is uh, 390 by 390 pixels resolution. Now, uh, for a lot of people, I think this is going to be a break-in or an initial purchase for a thermal device. And because of that, we have some extra materials in this video that might be of interest to anybody interested in getting into thermal. And also, uh, we have, uh, we're have we going to have a follow-on video for this because a lot of people, I know for me this display screen is a little difficult because I'm a little older. My up-close focus is, I'm using reading glasses, you know, up-close focus isn't so great. Hey, I've got another video coming up to show you how to make this thing into a monocular for cheap and easy, and it really changes the functionality of this device. So, hey, like and subscribe. Uh, we've got that good bit of information coming up next. So, in this video, uh, we're going to go over this tracker. Uh, again, this is $750. This is a fairly sizable price point for a lot of people. So, we're going to go over all four versions of it because you can still get the older version. Uh, you can get the lower resolution version, and you can save a little bit of money by doing so. So this may not be the, quite the right device for you, but we're going to give you all the information on the versions so that you can make an educated decision there. Uh, next thing, because this is a device I see a lot of people just getting as a first thermal, we're going to talk about how thermal works and do a little bit of a primer. And also go over conditions where thermal doesn't work quite so well. And Mother Nature was nice enough to give me a really crappy day for thermal where conditions, what I would call a thermal washout condition, existed. And I'm going to show you video of what you see with the naked eye and a washout condition on this where it's not going to be quite as effective as it would in, like you see in all these great hog hunting videos where they're showing you the unicorn button, rainbow, uh, everything's great versions of stuff. I'm going to show you when this isn't going to work as well as well because I want you to come in eyes wide open with any thermal purchase that's going to be something that can happen occasionally and you need to be aware of that so we'll go over that uh, next we'll get into the real review we'll do a little bit of a tabletop and we'll get into the meat and potatoes because we're going to go outside uh, set a camera up to show you what you see with a naked eye or what you might see through a scope and another camera behind the tracker to show you how it can help you and up your game in finding game as well as in tracking stuff. So we've got all that coming up and when, as we do this we're going to go out in the daytime look at cattle at 100 to 400 yards, uh, come back at closer to dusk, look at deer at 200 to 400 yards and then we're also going to go out at night with a piece of Gen 3 night vision with a camera behind it, a camera behind the tracker to show you how it can be used in conjunction with traditional night vision to up your night hunting game if that's what you're into. So we've got all the bases covered on this device and uh, I think we're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, as a part of this we're going to cover all the color palettes, we're going to also cover the beacon mode which is this has what Fleur would call outdoor alert on it where it's a black hot or white hot or even green kind of looking deal where it's going to highlight things of interest in yellow, orange, red flame looking colors to point things out to you very rapidly uh, and beacon mode allows you to calibrate that on the fly, very handy, very effective and I'm going to show you exactly how to use that and the benefits of it. So again, lots of good content. Now uh, with that I'm going to put one more plug in for the channel. We're doing good, I appreciate all the views, I appreciate all the likes and what I really need is I need subscribers. Uh, we've got enough view time on the channel to potentially be monetized, but what we don't have is enough viewers. And uh, so, hey, please hit that like button, 
hit that subscribe button. You'd be helping the channel out. It'll let you know when I have new content posted. And then if we get some income coming in from the channel, then it's going to be invested right back into doing uh, more frequent and better reviews of gear and other things that you might find interesting. So, hey, uh, do yourself a favor, do me a favor, like and subscribe. And with that, let's go ahead and get into our review. Okay, so first we'll talk about a couple things I like, a couple things I don't like on the tracker, okay? For the most part, it's a very impressive device. It's, it feels solid in the hands. It's all machined aluminum, very solid build quality on it, okay? Uh, things I like are its size. I mean, this thing will fit in a jacket pocket. Uh, if you wanted to mount it on something, now this thing's not recoil rated, okay? So don't, I'm not condoning putting it on a rifle. But if you choose to mount it on something, uh, the front narrow section of the tube, a 30 millimeter scope ring, grasps this thing quite firmly and nicely. A matter of fact, that's what I used was actually a 30 millimeter scope ring and a, a high rise mount to be able to put a camera behind this to film. So uh, yes, that will work, but if you put it on a rifle, if it breaks because of recoil, that's, that's on you, not on Leopold or Leupold. Now, uh, that being said, Simple, simple controls, three buttons across the top. They stick up so you can feel them pretty good. Uh, if you had thick gloves on, you're going to fumble with this a little bit. So I think they could have maybe raised or been more aggressive with their controls on this. Uh, but they function well. They're a little bit close together. And it's real simple to use. And we'll go over all that when we're out in the field actually going through, cycling through what the, all these buttons do. So uh, what else? The view screen, okay? This thing has a 390 by 390 resolution screen, and I know this is kind of small, but you'll see it better later on. Uh, right now it's in 1x mode, and I'm going to go ahead and zoom in. Uh, it has several levels of zoom. You go from 1x, which is a rectangular screen, 1.7x narrows your field of view just a bit, but fills your view screen. Uh, then 3, 5, 7, and back to 1. So uh, one thing, and again, the screen is a nice screen for what it is. But if you're older like myself and you're close in focusing distance isn't what it used to be to where maybe you use reading glasses, maybe you don't need glasses, but you use readers, you might find this kind of hard to use, okay? Uh, and that's the case for me. I, I, I don't really need glasses for distance vision. They help a little bit, but I don't need them. But for close-up, I use reading glasses. So in using the loophole, because of this small screen, I can't hold this this close and really focus on it. Well, I have to hold it, you know, when you get hold the news, you know, hold your newspaper, your magazine out a little farther. If you're in that category, this screen's going to be a little difficult uh, for you to use. Now, uh, before you say, oh, I'm that's it, I don't, I, I'm not interested in this because I have that issue, we're going to do another video. Uh, my next video on this is going to be a mod for this thing that's relatively easy to do to make it to where this is like a monocular for those of us that are close up vision challenged uh, to, to give this thing some usability and it may even be something even if you don't have that issue that you might want to do so stay tuned to the channel because we are going to have that coming up uh, so that's kind of a couple of things I don't like uh, the speed at 25 Hertz update I wouldn't want to have to if this were a scope I wouldn't I would say that's too slow uh, because if you have to do a shot on the run or you wing an animal and you're trying to track it and shoot, do a follow-up shot, 25 hertz is too slow for that. But for an observation tool, 25 hertz is good, okay? Uh, plenty, plenty enough uh, update speed for you to be able to observe animals and observe or track wounded game uh, with this device. Now, I do have one other thing I want to nitpick on this thing. And this is just something I'm going to show you, the process for changing batteries out in it. So let me power this thing off first. And basically, good construction, very well built, weather sealed. But you have to unscrew this knurled section in the middle in order to change your battery. And once you get that unscrewed, <coughs> what you'll notice is you slide this thing apart. And you see my battery kind of floating around in there. Now... There's a plastic piece that, I'm going to see if I can show it to you here, and I'll take some pictures, but there's a plastic piece here 
that has your connections to go from the screen to the sensor and all that up front. So you have to kind of bend this and lift your battery out. Okay, now notice I'm bending this, right? I'm flexing this. Now, on the back of this plastic is a ribbon cable. Okay, one of the uh, copper, like thin strips of copper la laminated between plastic. That's your electrical contacts to make this thing work. And I will say I'm not very fond of the fact that I have to, if I pulled this apart and that stayed straight, I'd be okay, but it, you can't get the battery in. You have, to, you have to flex this a little bit to set your battery in and do that. So every time you're changing your battery, you're flexing this, these little copper uh, strips that are running for connections. And, uh, and to me, that's a weak link on this tracker. Uh, I would think that if I had this thing for a number of years, the thing that would most likely fail would be getting a crack in that uh, plastic or on that on those copper strips rendering the device unusable. So uh, that's that's my nick pick. That's one beef I do have with this. I wish they would have made it make it a half inch longer so you could pull it out and just lift the battery out, make it a little more rigid. I think that would be a better design. But uh, it is what it is. So there you go. That's our tracker two and just general function. Now let's talk about the different versions here, okay? Okay, let's talk about the four different versions of the Leupold Tracker series. Uh, and the reason I'm doing this is because although the Tracker two is the current model, that's what you're going to see on Leupold's website. That's the latest and greatest version. There are still a good number of Tracker and Tracker HDs out there on the market as well that can be had for a cheaper price because, let's face it, $750 for the Tracker 2 is not exactly chump change here, okay? Uh, you might be better suited to save a couple hundred dollars, save a little bit of coin, and get the original version if, depending on what your needs and wants are, okay? And your pocketbook, that's a uh, wallet. That's the all, all, all got to be a factor, right? So let's talk about this. The biggest thing that the Tracker 2 has over the original Tracker is what is called beacon mode, okay? And basically all of the trackers, all four of them, have what they call high white, high black color palettes and that's going to be where it's either a white hot or black hot palette and then objects of interest that are warmer than the surroundings are highlighted in yellow, orange, red, look like they're on fire, okay? Flame kind of colorization. So that's all, all of them have that, okay? But the problem is your high white and your low white, generally when you go out into the field, a lot of times things are going to be highlighted. Trees, things that are just a little bit warmer, they're going to stand out and be highlighted, not just the things you're interested in being highlighted, okay? So that makes the high white and high black modes kind of a limited value sort of item. And by the way, high white, high black, if you're looking at FLIR devices, that's what FLIR, it's on the same thing as FLIR Outdoor Alert, okay? Let's just say, say that those modes are the same as Outdoor Alert on a FLIR device. So that being said, Beacon Mode allows you to recalibrate where the highlighting takes place at. So if I'm out there and I hop out of my truck and I'm scanning a field, and you know the field, the weeds, everything. I got red all over the place in this high white, high black, and it's like what a bunch of gobbledygook. Okay, I can hit the beacon mode button, and it all turns to just high, just black or white hot, because what it did at that point is it looked at the hottest object in the scene and said, okay, I'm anything that's in the scene right now, I'm not highlighting. So make sure there's no animals or people in the view when you do that. Uh, but press the button and now it resets where the zero takes place for highlighting to make it to where again as you're panning across now if there's a Bambi out there or a hog or a person or whatever they should stand out okay so it adds a good bit more functionality to those highlighting uh, color palettes on the device now uh, they do add another mode called high low green that is what I, it's very similar to what floor calls iron bow and uh, you'll see that out in the field a little bit but uh, and the, the uh, beacon mode works with that high-low green as well. Other than that, you still have white-hot, black-hot, your green screen. And uh, color palettes have changed between the versions, but I'll let you sort that out. Uh, but the, the important ones are there, white-hot, black-hot, and your green, are, which is very nice. So if you don't care about the highlighting, 
and that function and its usability isn't really important to you, you might be just as well served getting an original Tracker series, okay? Uh, so that's the big thing with the Tracker 2. Now, a couple of other things that are different. I mentioned the high-low green, which is like Fleur's Iron Bow, and Beacon works with that as well. Uh, you also have the ability to adjust your screen brightness, and I don't, I haven't seen, but I'm not sure if the original tracker gives you that ability, so you'll have to research that a little bit on your own. Uh, but the beacon mode is really it. Now, there are, well, there is one more big difference uh, in the Tracker 2 series compared to the original tracker, and that's going to be your field of view and the resolving power of the devices. And uh, that rabbit hole gets a little deeper, so let me pause and then I'll come back and we'll talk about that, okay? Okay, so the last thing I wanted to talk about when comparing the four different versions of the tracker are field of view and what that really means and the how that relates with the sensor size to, to the resolution you're going to be able to resolve, the resolution or the ability to resolve detail at distance. So uh, I'll post this when I'm done yapping here, but basically here we have the Tracker, Tracker HD, Tracker 2, and Tracker HD. Now what you're looking at here is I'm showing a representation of the field of view of these four devices, okay, for how wide the field of view is in degrees, and I've equated that into feet of uh, how, much, how many feet you're viewing at 100 yards width, okay. So for the original Tracker series, they both have 21 degree field of view and they're looking at 105 feet area across at 100 yards, okay? Pretty wide field of view. Now, where you come into an issue at is when you're looking at the original Tracker, the lower resolution sensor Tracker, because it only has 206 pixels of resolution horizontally, what that means is that at 100 yards, each pixel is going to represent a 6-inch square area. Okay, I mean basically, again, you're looking at an area this big. So carry that out to a couple hundred yards. Now you're in a, 12, in a foot square is the smallest thing this thing's going to be able to show you as, a, as an illuminated spot or a black spot or whatever saying, hey, there's something hot or cold here. That's, that's pretty coarse, okay? Uh, as far as usability for tracking a wounded animal, if you see which way he went, uh, kind of marginal, but for game spotting at some kind of distance, the original tracker was a little bit lackluster in performance, okay? Now, you up that ante to the tracker HD, and now you're looking still at 105 degree field of view, but that bigger resolution, that 320 wide sensor, is breaking it down to about a 4 inch square area at 100 yards or 8 inch by 8 inch area at 200 yards. Now you can see where this is going to allow you to see things, hot objects uh, like deer, coyote, a little bit better, very usable at 200 yards. At 200 yards, uh, you're 200, 250, you're really limited with this original tracker. So that's the original series. Now let's go on to the tracker too. Now, one of the big changes in the regular Tracker 2, the non-HD version, was what, that they really narrowed that field of view down to 14 degrees, which means that at, uh, at 100 yards, you're only going to be seeing about a 70-foot wide area when you're looking through this thing, okay? Which that kind of is a limitation, okay? It's going to make you have to scan more to look and see where things are at. But the reason they did that is because with this 206 resolution sensor, by doing that, they now have a sensor, a pixel area of 4.1 inches at 100 yards. So 200 yards, an 8 inch square hot spot or higher temperature object will show up as one pixel. So it's very similar to the Tracker HD, the original Tracker HD, in its ability to resolve objects at a farther distance, but they're doing that at the cost of field of view. Okay. And lastly, we come to the top dog out of the four here, the Tracker 2 HD. Now, they did narrow the field of view down just a tad from 21 to 18, meaning you lose a little bit, you have a 90 degree field of view at 100 yards. Still not bad, uh, pretty good for scanning with. And with that 320 resolution sensor, you're down to three and a half inch resolution at 100 yards, or a seven inch square at 200 yards.
So you can see where this is going to give you a more detailed image. It's going to allow you to see if that hot spot's a rock or a hog. Uh, it may help you determine a little better at a little closer range the difference between you know a hog and a sheep if you've got other livestock around things like that so higher resolution better is better tracker 2 HD is the best but the tracker HD isn't much of a slouch so again if you if you really need to beacon mode great if not you may be able to save a couple hundred dollars and really the tracker HD is pretty usable okay if beacon modes important and you're on a much tighter budget I would probably avoid the tracker, but the tracker too, even though it's lower resolution, narrower field of view, still gives you a pretty good detailed view, uh, albeit with a smaller area. Okay, so there you have it. I'll go ahead and post this. And uh, let's go on and talk about some of the limitations of thermal in general for those that are uh, new to the thermal game or maybe haven't had a lot of chance to go out and play in different circumstances with it. So let's uh, get on to the next step. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do now is I'm going to talk about some of the detractors to thermal and some of the limitations of it. And the reason I kind of wanted to throw this in here is because this Tracker HD, I can see a lot of people purchasing this that haven't had a lot of exposure to thermal imaging or thermal devices in general. So, you know, the video I'm going to show you later on was taken in really good conditions for thermal. Most of the hunting videos and the stuff you see online are all showing you the cat's meow, perfect conditions and saying, wow, this is just awesome. Uh, but that's not always going to be the case. And I think that if you're going to buy into thermal on any level you really need to have a good understanding of things that impact thermal and that there's going to be times where it's really not going to work that well okay it's just a limitation of the technology phys physical limitations of the world we live in so let's go ahead and talk about that uh, and if I can take some video to maybe show you where it's not working so well I'll try and do that and insert that in this video, but I, I, I probably, I'm probably not going to get that opportunity before I publish it. So I, in the meantime, this will have to suffice just uh, so bear with me here. So uh, here we have our high-tech graphic. And what I'm trying to depict here is here's a scene where you've got the ground, you've got, uh, you've got a rock over here, uh, you've got your animal that you're wanting to see, uh, you've got a tree and a stump, and showing the temperature differences on what would be considered a very good day for thermal. Uh, we'll say the humidity is relatively low, it got up to about 75 that today and sun was out so it warmed up the rocks, it warmed up the tree trunks, things like that. And now it's nighttime. we've got a, a good cool off, it's a clear sky so we're cooling off really good, it's down to about 50 degrees. Now in this scene uh, the way I'm going to represent the differences in heat that are going to allow you this, this thing to see well, uh, blue is going to be cooler and red is going to be warmer. And the more red I'm putting on something, the more difference in temperature there's going to be, the better thermal is going to be able to pick it up. Okay, So in this scenario, again, you've got a good bit of difference between your, 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 your leaves and your trees, your grass down here. That's all you know, cooled off pretty good, so it's got a good difference there. Your, your stump, your tree trunks, they're showing a good bit of thermal, giving radiating some heat from the day. Rocks, of course, they're really radiating heat, so they're going to stand out pretty good. And, of course, there's your prey animal or your whatever you're trying to look at. We'll call them a dog, a hog, a deer, I don't care. Uh, but it's going to be 95 to 100 degrees body temperature, right? So it's really going to stand out well, and you've got a lot of information here for that imager to show you a picture of what's going on in the scene. Okay, now uh, let's go ahead and go to maybe a little bit less optimal scene. Okay, so here we have similar scene, same objects in it, and if you'll notice, it only was up to about 40 degrees during the daytime, and it was kind of overcast, so you didn't have a lot of sun heating of objects that would absorb that kind of heat and it's 40 degrees, it's at night out, not a lot of temperature changes from day to night, okay? So now, do I have a temperature difference in the scene? 
Yes, but very little. I've got just a little bit of heat signatures here, a little bit of cooler on the trees and leaves. But my animal's still standing out pretty good because, of course, it's radiating heat at 90 to 100 degrees, whatever. Uh, so, not quite as good. I'm going to be able to see my target in this case, or the, the thing of interest, but as far as the background and being able to make out where it's at, what's around it uh, with this thermal, I'm going to start losing the ability to see that because there's not enough temperature difference to, to make contrast, a heat contrast, for the thermal imager to see. Okay, Now, in this case, we're saying it was a, a spring or late fall chilly out and stayed chilly. Now, even more challenging is if you're, like I, I'm living down in North Carolina and it gets to be, you know, around 100 degrees in the middle of July and August, okay? So, at night, it may only get down to 90 degrees, okay, or 95 degrees sometimes. If that's the case, now you have the same limited information that this thermal is trying to see in the first place, but guess what? Instead of having a huge difference between all the surroundings that your animal is uh, to where it's going to stand out, it's really not going to stand out much either because it's only 5 or 10 degrees difference between it and the background, okay? So in those kind of scenario, everything kind of washes out with thermal, okay? And again, that's the type of things that uh, a lot of people don't show you, and I'm going to try and show you that if I get the opportunity. So keep that in mind, thermal's not perfect, it's, it's limited by real world conditions. Now, there's one other thing we need to talk about that's going to limit your thermal and how well it's going to work. And that is things like rain or anything that puts a mass mass in the air that thermal's trying to see through, okay? Now I use the example of rain because that's the easiest to visualize. So, so here we have uh, we're, here we have uh, Joe's out here in the field and we're trying to look at him with our thermal and boy it's, it's raining cats and dogs out here so we have all these raindrops falling down and you know in the visible light spectrum yeah rain makes it difficult to see but you can still see fairly well in the infrared spectrum or thermal and long wave infrared all these raindrops are radiating whatever the heck temperature the raindrop is, okay? So that really, really will mask the information you want to see that's farther out. So that's an extreme example, uh, but what else will impact that? Fog will, okay? Same thing, you have water vapors in the air, uh, that water has mass, it's emitting a thermal signature that you're trying to see through, it's going to cloud things in the distance. Even humidity impacts thermal. So if it's 20% relative humidity, thermal is going to pick up way far out and you're going to see the differences really, really well. If it's a 98% humidity or really close to the dew point, you have so much moisture in the air that that moisture is adding a thermal signature of its own. So the air is actually thermally a little bit opaque, okay? It adds opacity to it that's going to mask your signature. So all of those things can impact thermal. And, you know, if you go on Amazon or whatever and you look at all the reviews on this, you'll have people who will say it's crap, it doesn't work. And other people say, man, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And some of that is going to be the conditions under which uh, they, the individual's using it in. And the fact is, some days this thing's not going to work so good. Other days it's going to work fantastic. Uh, so please understand that and, uh, you know, do some research online for what impacts infrared so that you can uh, know what you're getting into and, and not end up being disappointed because what you thought you had isn't always the way it's going to work. So there you have it. Let's go out in the field and, and play with this Tracker 2 HD. Okay, so here we are with Leopold Tracker looking at some cattle in the field. Let me go ahead and power it up and we'll see how this thing performs. Okay, so uh, just to give you an idea of what you're looking at, uh, the cattle we're looking at right now are about maybe 80 to 100 yards out in the foreground and the several cattle that you're seeing in the distance are actually about 200 to 250 yards, okay? Uh, and then if we go way off to the side over here, uh, I don't know if you can even really uh, make them out, but there's a whole bunch of cattle way, way back 
Uh, actually, that whole cluster of uh, highlighted red you're seeing out there is uh, all, all cattle. And they're like probably 400, 500 yards away. So let's go back to where we're uh, a little closer in. And what I want to do is walk you through the features on, on, your, uh, on your Leopold Tracker 2 HD. So let's go ahead. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in the tracker digitally a little bit. This is 1x, the native mode. You're seeing the full width of the screen. I'm going to go ahead to 1.7x. Now, that gives you a full screen, full, as big of an image as you're going to get to look at on the tracker. Now, like I said, the cattle in the foreground are about 100 yards. The, the most distant cow that you're looking at uh, is uh, the small speck in the center. Let me go ahead and see if I can actually range him because they're moving around a little bit. Okay, he's 270 yards, okay? So, yeah, that, that uh, cow that's just kind of turned a little bit sideways in the far distance is about 270 yards away. Now, we're at 1.7x magnification on a Leopold tracker, and it is in what's called high white mode. Uh, uh, in the meantime, the, the regular camera view that I'm going to be showing is that's from a GX80 or a G85 Panasonic and I have it set to be have the same field of view that I would have so it should be kind of a unity with what you would see with the naked eye. Uh, so let's go ahead with this tracker now. Right now, uh, there's an awful lot of highlighting with what uh, they call beacon mode on a Leopold. So what I'm going to do is there's the, your left button on top is your beacon button. I'm going to go ahead and press that once. Now if you'll notice it put a red square on the screen that's showing what it perceives as the hottest object and it basically nullified beacon for anything on the screen saying hey that's normal anything beyond that is a, something of interest okay. So that's obviously you don't want to have what you're looking for in there and hit the calibration mode for uh, or calibration button for beacon. So let's go ahead and get the cattle out of the scene and go ahead and do another calibration auto cow with the beacon. So again, pressing the very left hand button on the Leopold and now it's showing uh, something just uh, dirt out there as being our calibration point. Now I pan back around and my targets of interest are showing up, okay, and these cattle are all moving around and shifting on me and again the closest ones are around 100 yards away right now. Uh, and uh, the farther farther ones out there are are about 200 yards. Now, uh, so that's a quick cal on your beacon mode. Now, there's going to be conditions where beacon mode is not going to work so well. I experienced some of that last night trying to look at deer uh, in a field where the trees were warmer than the field, and the and the you know the deer were being highlighted, but I have big red splotches everywhere. And one thing you can do when you get into those kind of challenging situations is you can do some manual adjustment on your beacon mode. And I'm going to show you how to do that. Okay, uh, your beacon mode button again, the left button, I'm going to press and hold. Now, once you press and hold, a menu's going to come up and you can adjust the beacon mode. Now, I'm going to adjust it down, which is making it more sensitive. And the range on this thing is from minus 200 to plus 200. Now, notice I'm down to minus 26 and now it's starting to highlight... Uh, a whole bunch of stuff in the screen. So let me go ahead and get back into calibration mode and I'm going to go ahead and start raising that. So you can, again, you can manually adjust this and when you're done just leave it, step back out of, uh, of, the, of your manual cow mode and, and that way that'll give you a little bit more flexibility, make it a little more usable. Now I will say this, if you inadvertently press your left hand button again, it'll do another auto cow and then you're done. Uh, you'll have to go back through that process. Something else is you have different modes. Your mode buttons are on your right. So I'm going to go ahead and press the mode button. And the first time I pressed it, it showed me I was in high white and it reset everything back to its baseline. Okay. So again, you would have to go through and do your auto cal or whatever you wanted to do again. So let's go back and we'll go to high black. And uh, high black actually a lot of times looks a little more natural. So let's do an auto cow on high black and then go back to where the cows are. Okay, so see to me that looks a little more, a little more of a natural view. And, uh, 
and yeah, the, I, I really do. I kind of I like that high black a good bit. So while we're in high black now, the cows that uh, we have a, a calf and a cow about 100 yards out. So right now I'm going to just cycle through the zooms so we can get a good look at that. Now we're at 1.7 zoom, which is where you get your uh, whole 1.2 inch screen filled. We'll go up to 3x, 5x and lastly 7x and then we go back to 1x where uh, everything's at, at native but uh, but again you're not using your whole view screen so 1.7 and again these are cows at 200 yards 3x 5x and 7x now a lot of the complaints that I've seen when people talk about the Leopold tracker is that well you don't have detail and it the view stinks and they may or may not have been playing with the beacon mode and the manual adjustments to get the most out of it. And, and the other thing is you've got to realize that there are limitations to this technology, okay? This is a 320 by 240 sensor. Uh, so you're looking at about 3.5 3 to, 3 to 4 inches at 100 yards is what one pixel, one dot on the screen represents. That doesn't give you a lot of detail, but it does allow you to see thermal signatures and things of interest okay and that's all this is for so let's go ahead uh, while we're out here uh, we'll go ahead and cycle through the other modes again there's high black and it just did its default setting now we're at high low green which uh, to me is is a lot like iron bow uh, on a fleur on a fleur type of device okay uh, where your blues and purples are kind of cold and your reds and yellows are uh, hot. So let's go ahead and do an auto cal on that. Now if you'll notice there's a blue square and a red square and because it's high low it actually shows you what the coldest and the hottest points are and of course now in uh, in your high low green you're it's giving you this uh, iron bow look to targets of interest with uh, Again, a little bit, little bit different looking. I don't know if I like that mode so much. Uh, again, I tend to tend to like uh, most of the time your black hot type of mode. So let's go ahead. We'll just cycle on through these. Again, there's back to the default. Now we're in just white hot mode with no highlighting or no uh, beacon function. Uh, black with no beacon function. And then lastly, we have a green mode, which is like a light hot, white hot, but only in green. And I actually like that a lot for general observation, uh, especially when it's dark out, because the green is easier on your eyes. And uh, one thing with this is the green has a good contrast to it, unlike uh, some of the digital night vision that I've looked at where they have a green mode. They really don't implement it well because they wash everything out and you lose contrast, which makes it hard to really pick out details. Uh, where that they Fleur, or not Fleur, but Leopold uh, does a really good job with this one for making that green mode usable in the way it should be. So okay, so there you have it. Uh, that's that's a rundown on the Fleur, or, or Fleur, I've got Fleur on the brain here, on the Leopold Tracker 2 HD. Okay, so here we are, uh, we're recording now. I've got two cameras going, my G85 with a long lens on it, and I'm zoomed in to deer, a deer that's about 350 yards away right there, as you can see in the center of the tree line. Now, I've got my Leopold Tracker HD on, and it's in auto mode, so let me go ahead and change the highlight on it. And as you can see, it's not really showing up. Uh, of course, that's very, very small, one spot, literally, uh, one little spot in the viewfinder. Now, I'm at 1.7x, so let me zoom in on that. That's 3x, 5x, and 7x. So that's a deer, uh, literally, at 350 yards away. And it looks like he's got a partner just a little bit over there. Now, again, you know, this is... Uh, Yep, I see two of them. So uh, let me go ahead and go back out to 1x and let's go ahead and I'm going to go into our beacon mode menu 
And I'm going to make it a little more sensitive because we've got the roadway kind of screwing with us here up close. So let me see if I can get it to where maybe the animals show up a little better. And we're in white hot mode right now. And you can kind of see a couple little specks. Now if we go off and pan over here uh, into the middle, you can see there's deer. There's deer running all over out there, right? And... Uh, Again, they're not very pronounced, and we're just at 1.7x. And those deer got to be four or 500 yards away, okay? So uh, let's go back to our, oh, here we go. We've got a couple coming across. So let's go ahead, we'll recalibrate this. And you know what, actually, let me go to 3x. And what I'm going to do is go to, I like in this situation, the black hot mode works better. So there you can see, uh, you can see our herd of deer right off the end. And again, these, these two deer that are right in here, the bright spots, those are like 350 yards away. So that's what they're looking like on this Tracker 2 HD. So that's 5X, 7X. So it's 7X. Uh, there's the herd that's just off the corner. And that herd, again, they've got to be 400 yards away. So that's what you're capable of seeing. And this is, these aren't bad conditions for using this device. So let's go back to 1X. And, uh, you know, you can tell something's out there. You can't tell what it is. And there's a pair of them looking at me. Uh, we'll fill our view screen. And this is what I normally run it in, is a 1.7X, because that gives you really, you've got a full view screen and all the zooms are digital zooms. So that the zooms aren't really going to give you anything. Uh, but a big blurry blob, uh, but it'll it allow you to see just a slight movement a little bit, maybe a little better. And, and uh, again, we've got a lot of deer out in the field here. So let's just pan across and see what else we can see. There might be some more along this side, but they tend to congregate out in that open field. They were actually a little closer in the field here and when I pulled up and kind of pulled off and uh, oh, we got, looks like we've got a couple of uh, oh, yep I see them in a view and a, and a see them there. Not, they're, not, they're not triggering the uh, black hop but you can see them there are dark spots so let's go ahead we'll try and adjust our uh, adjust our Bambi finder. Now see how it's highlighting the trees, but it's also highlighting the deer. So we're going to leave it like that. And again, uh, uh, you know, it's this isn't earth shattering. It's not like you're like, holy smokes, but what a tool, right? I mean, we're at dust now with the naked eye. Now granted, my, my distance vision isn't that good. And with the naked eye, I can kind of see there's maybe a flea speck out there, uh, but not much. And let's, uh, Let's go ahead and uh, zoom in a little bit. Okay, there's 3x, 5x, and 7x. So, and that deer, I don't even, I don't even think my rangefinder will uh, be able to. Okay, it's calling. If I'm getting it right, let me hit the trees here. It's calling that that deer right there is 300 yards away. Okay, and. Uh, let me go back to, again, native view. And there's our 1.7x that I like to use. Now, what I'm going to do is, uh, oops, darn it. Sorry about that. It's kind of, the mountain gets a little loosey-goosey here. Let me uh, get some deer in the center of the viewfinder here. And so I can get the camera set back up. And okay, that way I can... Try and have the same same field of view. Get everything else kind of centered here a little bit. All right, where'd y'all go? Okay, right about there. Okay, so let me. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this camera to where I'm seeing about what the naked eye would see here. Okay, yeah, that's about 
So there you go. Now I've got the uh, now I've got the camera set to where things are sized. When I'm looking in the camera viewfinder, things are sized like I would see them with the naked eye. So so that gives you an idea again. Uh, actually, that 1.7x seems like that's about unity. Looking at both screens for uh, where that notch is in the height of the trees from the close into distance. So let's go ahead and cycle. That's black hot with the outdoor alert or high black. And it's not outdoor alert. What do they call it? Peaking mode. I get my name things confused. Okay, now this is your high low green mode, and I just recalibrate it. Of course, it's finding the road is hot with the red square, and the sky is the coldest with the blue square, and. Uh, See if we can tweak that a little bit. That's high low green. And to me, it's like a green background and kind of like what Fleur refers to as uh kind of like what Fleur refers to as iron bow is kind of the way I'm taking it. And okay, so there there we have the uh high low green. And let's uh let's go ahead and zoom back in with our camera. I just wanted to give you an idea of the kind of resolution we were looking at and uh, let's see they should be about centered there yep and you can see those deer are at the that corner is about 320 yards away so they got to be a good 400 420 and they're still looking at me like ah some this something shady's going on so uh, so there you go so Let's zoom in a little bit. There's three, five, and seven. So again, you're not going to see detail, but you are going to be pick out, be able to pick out that there's something there. And uh, let's go ahead. And there's a, there's more deer out there. And and now, uh, okay, I'm, I'm not aiming right. Let me get them in the middle of the floor. I'm not sure which. Group I'm actually looking at here. Okay, there's a few there. There's a couple tighter there. So yeah, those must be these uh, these ones here. And I, like I said, that's well beyond the range of my uh, range finder. So let's uh, do a cal on that, and that didn't do me any good. We do have a couple more modes that I'll show you, and that's again high low green. You have your standard white hot mode. Uh, and of course that's just without the highlights, without the orange on it. Uh, you also have a black, black hot mode. And again, I tend to like black hot a lot better. Uh, and again, like I said, you're, what you're seeing those black spots are, again, that's the, those are like 450 probably yards out or so. And that's 300 yards right at the tree line here. So let's uh, zoom into three. And we have one more mode to show you, and that is green, uh, green hot, or actually bright, bright. It's like a white hot only with green, and that's not doing us too much uh, justice, really, right here. But I have found in uh, in like just walking around with it uh, at night, I, I do like that green hot, green hot mode, and again you can. Do your, your your calibration button and all that stuff. None of that does anything unless you are in a white hot uh, or unless you're in the high white, high black, or high red. Now I could turn this down, I imagine. Uh, and you can do have you press and hold your center button, and now uh, you can actually adjust your screen brightness. So if I, in this case, if I turn the green way down, then uh, you can see that's a pretty pleasant picture there. And actually, the uh, the Leopold take on this for the for the green is a hell heck of a lot better than what I'm used to seeing with uh, you know what I'm used to seeing with digital devices because normally they just paste everything green and you lose contrast and everything else very difficult to use but uh, the implementation here is uh, is a lot better. Oops, back out of the menu. And go ahead and we'll brighten this back up a little bit and we'll go back to our uh, high black mode. See so, you now I'm making it's making the uh, boy look at that. That's a bunch of deer. Gosh, those ones there are, I don't know, those gotta be four or five hundred yards way over there. 
but again that's this is the issue where you run into where the trees are uh, making it very difficult to uh, oops, I keep pressing the wrong button here where the trees are making it very difficult to uh, to really see so if I hit a cow button again now it, it eradicates any of the highlights so you kind of want to we'll go up close maybe do a cow and uh, see what we can see at a distance here now okay still not quite enough sensitivity to do it so let's go ahead and we'll try this one more time just to play around we're in beacon mode and I'm going to start dialing the beacon mode down okay see the deer it's like a very touchy deal to get it to where the deer are kind of showing up without the trees or trying to get it to where the trees aren't really really messing with you so seven back to back to 1.7x which again for normal use in this road's really messing with us but uh the 1.7x the uh to me is kind of an optimal thing so we'll go ahead we'll shut this down uh, we'll wait a little bit let it get a little darker maybe the maybe they'll come a little bit closer in and uh, uh with a little bit of luck we can play a little bit more Okay, so here we are. It's a uh, not quite overcast night, but a hazy night. Uh, we're supposed to be close to a full moon, but it's not out right now. So it's pretty poor conditions for night vision. And uh, that being said, what we have is we have deer about 250 yards out. And uh, you can see them. We're in, uh, have the Leupold uh, with green screen on right now. So it looks like night vision. White, it'd be a white hot, only green. And we have our Gen 3 Alpha night vision going here. And uh, I'm trying to get a little bit better focus going here. And we don't, we're not using any illumination. So right now if I, so if I zoom out all the way, maybe I can get a little better clarity on all this. Again, it's always hard to get, uh, get a good view through night vision with a camera and we have a car coming from the distance so you can see the field being lit up a little bit but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and turn on our illuminator so now this is a pretty widescreen take through our night vision and I'm going to go ahead and zoom it in to the uh, screen to maybe give you a better idea of the detail you can perceive Of extra lighting going on here so let's go ahead uh, we have deer at 250 yards and so if we're out here and again I'm using illumination and this is a three and a half X scope and I'm, I'm again I'm zoomed in on this on the back end of it so as we're panning across you can see how it would be fairly easy to miss something but uh, with if you just had night vision now so as we're panning across, let's see, uh, okay, yeah, I see the deer, but I think I would, I would spot them a lot easier with the, with the loophole. So uh, they do kind of work hand in hand in conjunction very nicely. Let's go ahead and zoom back out. Whoops, I went out of focus there. Let's go ahead and zoom back out a little bit. And that's probably more about what I would see as far as field of view with the uh, as far 
far as field of view goes with the uh, night vision. And there is no illumination. Yeah, he's getting a little brave, getting a little closer to the road there, ain't he? And if I had to guess, I'd say he's maybe 200 yards away or so. There must be something pretty tasty by the road there. pretty brave aren't they now with that car driving past I could just barely see the deer uh, as they went past so Headlights coming and the uh, illuminator on the tree up close, and that's one of the downsides of night vision. If you have a lot of bright light sources kind of coming at you, uh, it does make it difficult to. Now I don't have any illumination. That's what I'm seeing. It's just from. And they're all coming across the road, going into the woods. See if anybody else has come out. <laughs> nope. Okay, so here we are looking into the backyard, and this is one of those conditions where thermal is going to work far less than optimal. Uh, what we have, it's been a, a rainy night, it's been actually torrentially raining uh, this morning a good bit. It's about 65 degrees out, so all what this rain has done is it's washed away thermal differences in the environment, okay? Uh, the temperature hasn't had any dramatic change. You can see it's kind of hazy out too. A lot of moisture in the air. But uh, so you, what you have is you have very little temperature difference as you look around out here in the scene. Now I'm going to put my hand out in front here and you can see, okay, yep, uh, an animal would show up. But your ability to distinguish other things in the scene are pretty limited. I mean, they're, they're, they're looking over here uh, at my at my van in my trailer, uh, you can't even really tell there's a vehicle there hardly in the thermal. So we'll go ahead and pan around. We'll switch to different modes a little bit. But keep in mind that if if you're in a situation where there's not temperature differences in the scene, then thermal really struggles to show you what's going on 
although you know if if you have a hot object if you had a lot you know if a, if a deer or something or a hog or a coyote ran out there yeah you'd see the coyote but you'd have no context you wouldn't have a lot of context to, to gauge what else was going on there okay so the high low green actually seems to bring out maybe a little bit more detail there's just a white mode black green high white and high black which again a lot of times I think high black is very is more helpful uh, I like that a little better than the high white so well there you have it there's a less than optimal look see through thermal and of course if it was you know if it was a warm summer day and, and it, or warm summer day or evening and you had the same thing rain only the temperatures were in the 90s uh, then even your animals aren't going to stand out nearly as much because there's again the background it's it's all about temperature difference not necessarily just temperature so there you have it thermal on a less than optimal situation being able to look at your thermal and actually actually see something here Ooh, we have dark out there can't tell there's some spot there. What do we got? Ah. Let me zoom in here see if I can see. I don't know if my views are exactly the same. Oh, there we go. So, there you go. So, it's a thermal washout. That This is even a, even a better example. We've got a, a cat. One of my cats actually, <laughs> he must have been hiding from the rain for a little while. So there he is. Let's go ahead and zoom back out with this thermal. So he's wandering around out there, and uh, but again, you're not seeing a lot of detail. Not much to, for the cue on, I mean. But you're but he's standing out. And again, that's what I was just saying. Uh, is that uh, okay? Animals are going to stand out because it's 65, but the details for you to be able to make out what the hell is going on in context aren't. And again, if this was uh, a much hotter day, then uh, then we would end up with uh, having even more washout and the animals not showing up. So there you go. I just wanted to show you that, and I didn't get. To I hope you enjoyed this review of the Loophole Tracker 2 HD. If so, please like, share, and subscribe. This video took a lot of time and effort to produce, and while it's free to download for personal or educational uses. Please link and give credit. Commercial use of this video is expressly forbidden without my written consent. And thanks for watching. Copyright 2020 by Phoenix Rising.